Imagine spending an hour with the world's greatest traders. Imagine learning from their experiences, their successes, and their failures. Imagine no more. Welcome to Top Traders Unplugged, the place where you can learn from the best hedge fund managers in the world so you can take your manager due diligence or investment career to the next level. Before we begin today's conversation, remember to keep two things in mind. All the discussion we'll have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their product before you make investment decisions. Here's your host, veteran hedge fund manager, Niels Kostrup Larsen. Welcome to another edition of Top Traders Roundtable, a podcast series on managed futures. My name is Niels Kostelas and I'm delighted to welcome you to today's conversation with industry leaders and pioneers in managed futures, which is brought to you by CME Group. Now, today is a very special episode, not just for me, but for the whole managed futures industry, because for the first time in a very long time, we have brought together some real pioneers of systematic trading and trend following strategies who you may say changed the way the world came to learn about this investment strategy through the countless articles and books that has been published about the experiment that became known as the Turtle Program. But where I think until today very little has been shared by the creator of this incredible success story in the world of finance. So I'm very pleased and super excited to welcome Richard Dennis, who really don't need any introduction, but for those of you who don't know, Rich is the creator of the Turtle Program and the original mentor to my other two guests here today. Because I'm also joined by Brian Proctor, a Turtle and Managing Director of EMC Capital Advisors. And last but not least, one of my own mentors when I got started in the managed futures industry many years ago, namely Jerry Parker, another Turtle, founder and president of Chesapeake Capital. First of all, Welcome and thank you ever so much for joining me today for this truly special conversation about managed futures and trend following. Before we jump into today's conversations, which for obvious reasons will take us back to the 1980s, I want you to share with our listeners a little bit about each of your backgrounds and leading up to the year 1984, where the turtle story really begins. Now, since you, Rich, had a lot more trading experience than Jerry and Brian back then, why don't we start with you? What twists and turns had your career exposed you to leading into 1984? That's a good question. Well, I had been a floor trader for 14 years and uh, had gone off floor about four or five years before the uh, turtle program started. And... Uh, it was clear to me that you needed to trade more markets than one or two that you could run around in within the pit. So we started to trade from the office. Sure. And the the thing about the trend, you know, trend following clearly became sort of your style of trading, Rich. And I'm curious to know what was your first introduction to trend following? I mean, were you inspired of some of the earlier pioneers like Richard Donchian, Bill Don, or Keith Campbell, to name a few, or, or how did that get into your life? Well, uh, I'm not sure it was quite legal, but I was started to trade when I was about 17. And there were, there were some books, but they were by people who are long gone about trend following. And mm -hmm. I just started to do research just by hand way back then. Okay. Okay. And so you didn't come across any other people doing the same thing? Because this is something that I've heard from a lot of people, actually, that, um, you know, they were doing their own thing and they didn't really realize that other people were doing the same. Right. I came to uh, know the people you mentioned and that uh, well after uh, um, I had started trading. And really, sure. some, of, some of the people who uh, talk about the turtle program and that uh, – I didn't even know that they were commenting on it at the time. Right, 
Right. And and the same thing, actually, it's interesting because he, over here in, in Europe, AHL, one of the first CTAs uh, on our side of the Atlantic, was formed actually at the same time as the Turtle program began. And when I interviewed one of the founders, Martin Lurik, he also said that he did not recall having really heard about a US-based trend following community before they got started. So very interesting. Now, Jerry, since you joined the Turtle program in late 1983 in the first class of the Turtles. Why don't you share with us what life was like for you leading into this truly life-changing experience? So I was in Richmond, Virginia, and I was working for an accounting firm and going for my CPA certificate, knowing full well that that's something I wanted to not do very long. And sort of as a hobby, I would read books about the stock market and watch Wall Street Week and get the Marty Zweig newsletters. So Marty Zweig was sort of a trend follower type. And so that was my first introduction to sort of trend. And then I would maybe read a book about futures. And I thought, oh, futures, that's good. Because I mean, leverage has got to be okay. I can understand that. And currencies, commodities, interest rates, I mean, more diversification, being able to go short, that's made perfect sense to me. So I sort of thought, okay, I sort of see how this thing works now. It's are the large profits going to pay for the small losses? And so I probably sat at my desk in this accounting firm and just started uh, seeing how how fast you know a thousand dollars would compound at one hundred percent per year. So I thought, yeah, this is going to be a lot of fun. This is really a great idea. And then I actually did read an article about Rich. I think it was in Business Week. So. In late 19, um, I don't know, maybe August or September 83, when I saw the ad in the Wall Street Journal, I thought this was just a totally legitimate situation. You know, it seems too good to be true, but I knew that this was something I should apply for and wanted to do. Yeah. And, and do you know what the article about Rich actually was, was talking about? I mean, what, what fascinated you about the article? Do you remember that? Probably, you know, just the amount of money that he had made or something like that, uh, right. spe speculation. But, but trading in general, I thought, was certainly a, something I wanted to do. I, I don't know mm -hmm. why or how it got into my head, but I thought this was... And then the technical part of it and looking at trends just, uh, you know, so often now in, in the past 25 years and talking to clients or potential clients, we need to... We feel like if we don't word it exactly correct, we uh, they won't uh, allocate money to us, and we have to convince them and show them, and maybe we're not educating them enough. I mean, I I thought this was the greatest thing ever when I first started learning about it, and didn't need anyone to sort of uh, convince, convince me. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. How how about you, Brian? I'm interested in finding out, you know, what your career was like and and where it was heading back then, and 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 how you ended up in the second class of of the Turtle program, which started, I think, a year after Jerry. That's right. In 1982, I graduated from Miami of Ohio and thought I'd get into investment banking at that time. But there was a recession in 1982, a pretty bad one. And so there were no banks hiring. And I happened to just be lucky enough to, to meet a guy named Everett Clip, who ran an FCM and where a lot of locals, the guys who traded in the pit for themselves, worked and he was kind enough to show me around the board of trade and make an introduction to a newly formed firm C and D commodities which was the C was uh, stood for Larry Carroll's name and the D for Rich Dennis so I actually started working for Rich as a runner a phone clerk a back office trade checker pretty much whatever there was to do with regards to the trading operation. So I got to see the first wave of turtles come through and be very successful. And when, when Rich and Bill were thinking about a second round, I had a conversation with Rich and he told me it would probably be in my best interest to forego my thoughts of making the way into the pit and trading, filling paper for principles of C&D and, and kind of make the next step to the next level and learn um, how to trade off floor. So I, I didn't have to go through the whole process that 
the first group of turtles did per se the interview process. And I did, t I did look at all the questions and it's fun to look back at those, but I had an entree that was a little bit different. Sure. Sure. No, absolutely. It's funny that all of you, or at least I think Rich and, and you, Brian mentioned this thing about trading off the floor was that the way you thought about it back then rather than trend following? I mean, did the, the, the term trend following, was that even part of your vocabulary back then? Or was it just the fact that here's a method to trade without being in the pit? Well, I certainly heard about it, obviously, from Rich and so the partners at CND who were who had all started, I believe, on the floors and moved off floor to trade a a diversified set of markets and and see and take and take the opportunities to trade in markets that were moving and trending sometimes the grain markets would be rather dull and quiet and there'd be other markets in new york that were more volatile and, and provided more opportunities so when i first started it was obviously just getting to know the the mechanisms of the floor and then obviously finding out there were other ways to be successful in the business. Sure. No, absolutely. And I, I guess, of course, that, you know, your story, Brian, also when talking about that, we shouldn't forget about the founder of EMC, namely Liz Cheval. I think the only female turtle, as far as I recall, but who, of course, sadly passed away only a few years ago. How did you end up working with her, uh, meaning were you close with her even back then during the program itself? Well, I think uh, all of us got to know each other pretty well during the program and still some pretty good friendships there. As far as keeping in touch with with some of the turtles, I do and I did. Liz was one of them and I had just come back from uh, trading for a, a hedge fund in New York and was temporarily working at Morgan Stanley, where they had a managed futures fund offering with multiple CTAs, of which Liz was part of it. And I just reached out to her to talk about that particular group of CTAs that Morgan Stanley had put together and tell her that I was looking around for another opportunity. And a few months later, she called and said, how would you like to work here? So sure. that's how that happened. Now, Today, we'll cover a number of different topics around the turtle story and what the whole debate about nurture versus nature means in the world of trading today. But I'm also hopeful that we will be able to put some of the myths to rest about the turtle experience before we all forget what really took place back then. So I want to come to you again, Rich, for my next question. Now, there has, over the last three decades, been so much talk about how this trading experiment was named, what the inspiration for the turtle name really was. Some people say it was related to you seeing a, a turtle farm in Singapore, I think I heard. And another story I heard was it was related to a rock band called the Turtles that performed back then. Why don't you put us all out of suspense and share with us the true story about how the name came about? So I, I'm going to stick with the, the first story about the uh, turtles in Singapore. Okay, and then actually, that's how they got the name. It was a kind of a misnomer, but it sort of stuck. I mean, if if I had a dollar for every plastic turtle the people have given me, I'd uh, be indeed rich. <laughs> <laughs> But but also talking about the name itself, and 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 I and I wonder whether you know uh, the seeing the turtles in in Singapore was something that happened you know years before you you actually did the program. But I also wanted to talk about the, the inspiration for for the idea behind creating the turtle program because again we hear so many stories relating to one in particular that seems to be very popular is that you and your partner back then, Bill uh, Eckhart, having seen the movie Trading Places with Dan Aykroyd and Eddie Murphy, where there was a bet made about whether or not you could train anyone to be successful in I'm trading. Gonna, you're going to get a heaven's no on that one. Oh, good. Excellent. Excellent. Well, can you share with us how the, the whole idea behind the, tur the turtle program came about? Uh, sure. So one lazy Sunday afternoon, I was hanging out with uh, Johnny Walker Black and... <laughs> 
I uh, started to think about my own trading and realized that I, well, a lot of it was just sort of rules that you know were informal and that I noticed that other traders operated according to rules. Also, and some of those rules were very bad, like a lot of traders at that time, their one rule was always buy soybeans. But having thought about my trading and the rules, it seemed to me that at that time, I just, to put a number on, I thought that two, two thirds of trading was following rules and maybe one third was intuition, the dreaded flare that we talked about during the course and that. So as the ice cubes melted, I started to make some notes about what I thought was true, what, what you could do to prove it. And because it could turn out to be one of these endless debates that never comes to any conclusion. And it seemed to me that we could resolve the question by uh, trying to train people and giving them rules and uh, talking to them about intuition and things like that. And that was the genesis. And nobody told me it was a great idea, but no, nobody wanted to tell me it was stupid either. So we did it. Sure, sure. How, how long before the actual program started was this? Was this something that you reacted on very quickly and said, yeah, this is a great idea, let me let me do it? Or did it have to sink in for a while, so to speak, before you created the program? It was only a couple of months before we put the things in motion, like advertisements and newspapers, that led to starting in, about in January of 84. So... Not, not such a long period of time after I thought of it. Fantastic. I, th I think that's a great story. And thanks for finally putting the record straight on, on this point. Now, Jerry, I want to bring you back at this point because you were obviously one of the first people who saw the, the famous ad that Richard mentioned in the Wall Street Journal. Now, the process wasn't just about apply here and you're in. Tell us about the process you had to go through in order to get selected. You know, one of the funny things about recollecting all of this is everyone has a different recollection. And so that's the disclaimer I feel like I should make. But so you get the test, you send your resume in, you get the test back and like 100 true, false, and some discussion questions that you have to answer in one sentence. Well, Jerry, don't be modest. I think you got all the questions right, which was yeah. you were, you were yeah. the only person that did. I suspected it was an open book test on your part but that, that, that <laughs> was okay yeah i carried this test around with me to all the audits you know for weeks and would work on it and show it to my friends and say what do you think and they'd say false i'd say no nah, i think that's true so i hold, held on to it as long as i could i sent it back in and then i got a phone call and i was always looking at the wall street journal and replying to ads, invest here and get a free book on how to trend follow or something like that. So I got this phone call. I just thought it was, you know, somebody else. And so I sort of ignored the phone call. Then I got another phone call from Chicago and I was like, oh, maybe crap, that could be a, a, a phone call I should take. So I finally took the call and went for the interview, went to Chicago and my head was just full of these facts. I was, I was like cramming for an exam which was totally ridiculous and unnecessary. So we got up there and had, uh, you know, went for the interview. And yeah, I thought I did pretty well. And I thought I'd done well in the test. And I thought I had shown some passion and desire. So it was a great situation. Yeah, no, absolutely. Now, Brian, you joined a year after Jerry. And tell me, did you and your fellow turtles, so to speak, have to go through exactly the same process as Jerry did? Or had it changed from class one to class two? I think it was pretty much the same. Uh, Rich could verify that. But I, yes, as I was. mentioned, I was already working for C&D and for Rich for a couple of years prior to that. So when the next second batch of turtles came along, I just had a, a conversation with Rich and he, he suggested that it was a better career path for me not to go down to the floor, but to be part of this. And so I took the, the same questions. Obviously, I pretty much knew a lot of the answers before that because I had been working there and, and began to understand what the partners at C&D 
how they thought about trading. So for me, it wasn't the big formal process that I think most of my peers had to go through. No, that makes sense. Now, returning to you, Rich, clearly the application process was intended to give you a variety of applicants. I think there's a very different backgrounds from, from my recollection. Share with us what you were looking for in this diverse group of people and were there any particular skill set that they all had to have for for you to select them? Well, there was no sort of killer uh, aspect to it that uh, one per- thing you needed to know or not know. We had to, you know, informally, I guess, in our heads, a, a few different things. We preferred people who hadn't actually been on the floor and traded because that was kind of a detriment. It wasn't what they knew. It was what they knew for sure that just wasn't right. Right. So that was one thing. Another thing is we look for people with statistical aptitude. We wound up with a lot of blackjack players, professional blackjack players. Okay. Who are, if nothing else, new odds. And, and we, we thought that was good. We did ask some questions to get to learn something about generalized intelligence. But I do have to say... I'm not sure that we did a great job of selecting people, and we selected people and had various sort of expectations how well they would do, almost all of which were not true, which fits into another part of the story, really. The more I think about it, the more I think the turtle thing worked, and I think in in general, to trade at all and have it work is you have to be rule-oriented. So mm-hmm. we took people who you would have said, this person has no chance and this person should be good. And we couldn't uh, pinpoint it at all. Interesting. Very interesting. Now, speaking about that, and maybe we come back to you, Jerry, you got, as, as far as I understand, you know, very little training, so to speak. Tell us a little bit about that, but also, you know, uh, tell me whether when you were taught these rules uh, initially, I mean, whether this made sense to you the first time you heard it, so to speak, or, or did it did it take a while, be, be, you know, before it sort of made perfect sense? Well, we got great training, sufficient, what more than more than enough. So uh, our training could not have been better. And on top of that, we got a lot of time with Rich and Bill and support crazy support from that you don't get in the real world. Mm. So what was the second part of your question? No, I was just going to say, so, so you had this training, which I, I, is it fair to say it, it lasted two, three weeks. Is that uh, from right? That's two or three weeks. Oh, I know it did take some time. You know, we had something where we could go up and have lunch with rich and trade with rich. And I know some of those, were very beneficial because I was able to ask certain questions and start understanding more of the philosophy and what was going on with the trades and how to think about the trades and the markets systems. So that was our trader for a day with Rich was very important. I think, uh, and I've said on other podcasts that, you know, it's so important, the sort of support we had and maybe an environment that we never have again where if you're doing the right thing, you're gonna. That's gonna be the bottom line on your uh, performance or your the evaluation of your performance. Versus, please make me some money, and I don't really care how you do it. In fact, these rules seem a little stifling. You don't really should probably you should use more flair, uh, for instance, which is a typical client. But you know, I've said before, it's a bad analogy, but it's kind of like saying, if you, yeah, if you print the rules, maybe people can follow them or they'll know some good rules, but. You know, you won't be a Marine by reading a manual. And I think that we became uh, much better traders because of our just time spent with Rich and Bill and the way they ran the program was something we, far, far beyond just a set of rules. I should say this about the rules. In my old age, I've come to believe that mediocre rules are better than good traders' judgment. And that's because... One thing in this business you need is persistence, and it's almost impossible to be as persistent using judgment. Obviously, if you follow a system and do everything, 
you're being 100% persistent. So it's a little, it's a part of r- rule orientation that's underappreciated. Rich, once you had your group of turtles and they'd been through their training, and I, you know, I'm assuming that the second group got the same training more or less. Did you allocate the same amount of money to all of them or did you base your allocation on how well they did or how well they applied the rules that you just taught them? What did you reward, so to speak? Well, I believe they all started with the same amount of money, but as things went on and we saw their performance and talked to them, then there was a lot of asymmetry in the allocations. Okay. Okay. On a slightly sort of separate point, but but I'm just curious, when did the media first get wind of, of the turtle story? And, and, and was it you, Rich, who let them know? I mean, I've seen an article in the World Wall Street Journal from September 1989, which obviously is after the program ended, but I'm not sure if this is the first time the media started reporting on the turtle program. Do any of you recall? Well, I don't remember ever talking about it while we were doing it. Mm. And that's one of the things that I've continued to do. I do talk about it, but I don't want to sort of talk about exactly what it was that uh, we were doing or anything like that. I I could have lived with anonymity for, for the whole thing. Yeah, no. Okay. Now, if we just go back to the subject about what was taught back in 1984, I just want to ask all of you if you feel that now, some 30 years later, that this is grossly out of touch with the reality of how trading should be done because things do change or at the same time in life and in markets, a lot of things stay the same. Feel free to go first, any of any of you on, on, on this one. Well, good luck with that one. <laughs> well, the markets have changed a lot. I mean, what works changing is a bit of a problem. But what's more of a problem is a lack of volatility. And volatility, it seems to me, sort of has trailed off over the years intermittently. Mm. And, you know, I'd rather have the volatility back i'd worry about i mean that's a variable you can't control but i think it's more important than adjusting the system although adjusting the system is important too sure 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 i mean maybe i should ask that to brian and and you jerry so applying sort of the the raw turtle rules in the year 2017 that would still work well i would say the basic philosophy hasn't changed you're you're continuing to do research, finding robust systems, uh, and that means systems with the least amount of parameters that tell you how to initiate liquid aid or stay out of a trade. So it's, you know, we're always looking to ca- build systems that are based on momentum or based on range dependent discrete time frames where you're confirming that a trend is in place. So you're always looking to capture directional price movement. And obviously, managing risk is paramount. So you, you, you manage risk from the trade size. You limit it in the markets and sectors that you trade. We have a, a risk management concept that overlays the portfolio that's based on marginal utility. So, so we're actually harvesting profits along the way, which is very different than what we did uh, learn the, the original turtle trading programs. But we're still doing the same things, just a little bit differently than we used to. Sure, sure, sure. Now, some people will claim that one of the secrets to success in trend following is diversification among markets that you put in your portfolio. So I'm interested in learning what, or, you know, from you, where you think that is, is, is true and that you essentially should trade as many markets as you possibly can or if there are certain markets, such as, I guess, maybe the VIX index, that just doesn't lend itself well to to trend following. What about you, Jerry? What do you think on this one? Well, I've definitely traded as many markets as possible. And I think it's probably, and of course, there are a handful of markets like the VIX that I wouldn't trade, like, like 
it's, I guess if I pretty much our strategy has been, if it's liquid, we will trade it. So now I do think that setting up the portfolio, the risk budget amongst the sectors and the markets. So when you start adding more and more bond markets that are 90% correlated, you know, you can trade them. It's no downside probably, but you want to not to pay attention to your sector, your bond sector allocation, for instance. So I definitely, and then of course, I have been very outspoken on trading single stocks and not trading the indices. So I think uh, the drawdowns are smaller, the diversification is better, and CTAs in general would never trade the dollar index and no currencies or a commodity index, fewer commodities. So never made much sense to me not to have pretty nice allocation to equities long and short, three, two or three from each sector, build a nice diversified portfolio, maybe some non-US ADRs, et cetera. So, and sometimes, you know, we allocate 25% of our risk budget to equities and we made 25, we made 20% in 2013 and over a hundred percent of that came from stocks. So sometimes stocks are the only game in town and you need to, it, it always baffled me, especially over the past eight years when trend followers would badmouth the stock market because I guess of the crisis alpha stuff that people talk about, but to me, it was just another trend. That's what was moving and we need to be there. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Maybe, Rich, I wanted to to hear your opinion about this, and and maybe your opinion has changed since back then to to the way you look at it now. I don't know, but in in your opinion, in a in a trend following following portfolio, what's the right balance between financial futures markets and commodity futures markets? And 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 I'm assuming you don't have to worry about you know size, liquidity concerns as some you know, very large CTAs have to do to do today. So if you could choose your optimal portfolio of markets, what what would the balance be between these two? Well, in fact, the liquidity so dominates the choice of trading that the balance just winds up being created by picking the liquid markets. So, I mean, when you get down to it, you're probably trading 15 or 20 commodities and 15 or 20 financials. And uh, that's kind of, at least to me, an accident of where the liquidity is. I mean, if so somehow the liquidity shifted, I, I, it wouldn't bother me to be unbalanced. Mm. I mean, the, co the correlation in trades, I mean, it's not, I mean, it, wheat and corn are maybe going to do the same thing, but you don't get all that much correlation. So to have you shifted it from 20 commodities to 15 and one up to 25 financials, I wouldn't worry too much about that. Sure, sure, sure. Now, it seems to me that it's been difficult to get support from many types of investors and other types of investment professionals, not to mention the financial press that the type of diversification and trading philosophy that trend following offers, such as providing access to very different and uncorrelated markets, being able to go long and short, taking small losses and letting the winners run, et cetera, et cetera, that this approach is superior to just buying an index of stocks and keep it until retirement, so to speak. Why do you think that with all the evidence that we can show today that only a minority still of investors have embraced trend following and made it a core part of their portfolio. And again, I open that up to everyone. I'd love to hear all of your opinion. Do you want to go first, Brian, on this one? Sure. I would say that the return stream in general for trend following is much more difficult for institutional investors to stomach. Some of them have internal rules about how much volatility an investment can have, what kind of drawdown a certain investment can have. And, and uh, for the most part, CTAs, you know, trend following CTAs surpass those thresholds. So I think that's part of it. I think another part is they consider us to be 
for lack of a better word, a black box, which means they don't understand how we do what we do, to which I tell them we can show you and predict in which environments uh, our trading style will perform well and which environments it won't. And we can show you how we think about the markets and use statistics and probabilities in our favor. To me, the real black box is the discretionary trader who you don't know what's going through his mind in any given market environment or on any given day. That's the real black box. But I don't know. It's it's always been a mystery to us why more money hasn't flowed into the managed future space. Mm. What about you, Rich? Have you given this a lot of thought or do you have any thoughts about it? Well, I would just say a couple of short things. I think that the performance of hedge funds relative to CTAs, if you go back 10 years, was better and that the hedge funds hogged all the allocations. Now, of course, they've fallen on some fairly hard times. Mm. So maybe that's over with, but that detracts from allocation and also obviously a a stock market that goes in more than triples in eight years draws people's attention. So those are fairly big things. And if, even if hedge funds go south or stocks start, start not to go up, you would think that what you're talking about would be reversed, but it hasn't happened so far. (laughs) That's true. What about you, Jerry? I know you've been out talking about this for, Yes, I think it's the fees and expenses, historical the fees and expenses, the volatility, that was mm. too much. But now I think it, and the stock market, of course, but now I, I mean, I read a lot of articles, so I'm a heavy user of uh, Google Alerts. So, I mean, I read something this week that said the only inflows in hedge funds were with CTAs last year. So now yeah. I think it's another question of how large is your firm? Does your firm make me comfortable? Do you, how many PhDs do you have? It's less about the markets and performance. It's more about the, there are lots of assets coming to CTAs, but only four or five. Thanks for listening to Top Traders Unplugged. If you feel you learned something of value from today's episode, the best way to stay updated is to go on over to iTunes and subscribe to the show so that you'll be sure to get all the new episodes as they're released. We have some amazing guests lined up for you. And to ensure our show continues to grow, please leave us an honest rating and review in iTunes. It only takes a minute and it's the best way to show us you love the podcast. We'll see you next time on Top Traders Unplugged.